Once I visited my cousin in Milwaukee, USA. She got boyfriends by the dozen when she... In this lecture, we'll introduce the basics of semi-direct products, which will be a new way of creating groups from older groups. So we start with two groups. Semi-direct product is some operation where we create a new group from them. But before jumping right into the definition, I want to talk about some examples and relate them to this recognition theorem for direct products. So I want to start by talking about an example that Conrad uses in his notes quite frequently that uh, is called the affine group or the group of two by two affine matrices. So this is a matrix group that represents certain nice geometric transformations. But here's the setup. So we'll let F be a field. Uh, we define the affine group or the affine group over F to be the set of two by two matrices, A, B, zero, one, where A is any non-zero elements of F and B is any elements of F. So we haven't talked about fields in general, um, but uh, so in this case for now, it's okay to just think about the cases where F equals R and where F equals Z mod PZ. So the important thing is that in a field, we have both a way to uh, add elements and a way to multiply elements and every non-zero element has an inverse that's in F. Okay, so this group of affine matrices is actually a group. So let's just see what happens when we multiply two such matrices, A, B, 0, 1, A prime, B prime, 0, 1, A, A prime, 0, 1, A, B prime plus B. Okay, so this uh, operation is well-defined. You take two matrices in this set, you get back another one in this set. The operation is associative uh, because matrix multiplication is always associative because it's just composition of functions. And what is the inverse of AB01? It's A inverse 0, 1, negative B times A inverse. We're okay, what is negative B? Negative B is the uh, additive inverse of the element B. All right, so how big is this group? Well, uh, you know, if your field is infinite, then there's infinitely many choices for B and it's infinite. But if F is Z mod PZ, then we have B choices, sorry, we have P choices for B and we have P minus one choices for A. So the size of this group is P times P minus one, P squared minus P. So if you just think about uh, some examples, like when P equals two, this group has size, two squared minus two is two. So uh, it's cyclic. I mean, there's the identity matrix and then only one other. And when P is three, this has size nine minus three, which is six. So we've already talked about the classification of groups of order six. So you can ask yourself now, which one is it? All right, so what I wanna do next is talk about two special subgroups inside this uh, group. H is going to be the set of all matrices that are one, zero, one, Y in the upper right corner, where Y can be any element of F. It's easy to check that this is actually uh, a subgroup if you just put in um, A equals A prime equals one, you'll see that you get a one up here and then you get another matrix in H. Um, same thing, inverse of an element uh, in H stays in H. So what does this subgroup look like? Well, it's isomorphic to uh, F as a group with the operation plus to the additive group of this field F. So right when you uh, multiply one Y zero one and one Y prime zero one, you get one zero zero Y plus Y prime. So it's just like adding the elements in the top right corner. Okay, so the second subgroup I wanna talk about is K, which are the subgroup of elements that have a zero in the upper right corner. So X zero zero one, where X is just any non-zero element of F. And this is also a subgroup. If you multiply two elements in here, set B equal B prime equal zero, you get A A prime zero zero uh, one. So when you multiply two elements in here, you're really just multiplying the corresponding elements 
in the multiplicative group of F. So uh, for a field, the set of non-zero elements is a group under multiplication. So we're seeing that this subgroup is isomorphic to the multiplicative group of this field. And these two subgroups together combine to say some nice thing about the whole group here. So any matrix in this uh, affine group can be written as a product. So let's take any matrix, x, y, 0, 1, and we can write it as 1, y, 0, 1 times x, 0, 0, 1. So you can check that this is actually true by looking at what happens when you multiply on the right. So the tricky thing here is remembering that the matrix corresponding to y comes before the matrix corresponding to x. OK, so what are we seeing? We're seeing that inside this group G, you can write every element as something in H times something in K, so that this product set H times K is the entire group H. So in particular, I mean, it's definitely contained in G. Uh, so HK is equal to G, which means that HK is a group. So we've talked a lot already about under what conditions for two subgroups, H and K, the product set HK is a group. So I'm going to pause and erase, and then I'll talk more about properties of these groups, H and K, and relate this to the recognition theorem for direct products that we talked about a few lectures ago. We've introduced this group, this group of affine matrices, and two special subgroups, H and K. We've seen that G is equal to the product set H times K. Why is that? Because you take any element in G and you write it as something in H times something in K. So what does that mean? HK is a group. So what else can we say about this internal direct product of H and K? Well, clearly the intersection of H and K only includes the identity element. Because to be in K, you need a zero in the upper right corner. And uh, so if you set Y equal to zero, you just have one element left in H. So now, this almost looks like the kind of thing where we could apply the recognition theorem for direct products. So let's ask, is G isomorphic to the direct product, H cross K? And the answer is no. I mean, certainly no if F is equal to the real numbers or Z mod PZ, where P is bigger than 2. I want to exclude the case P equals 2. And why is this not isomorphic to a direct product? Well, the right-hand side, H is isomorphic to uh, the additive group of this field, which is abelian. The additive group of a field is always a, an abelian group. And K is isomorphic to the multiplicative group of this field, which is also an abelian group. So the right-hand side is abelian. But G is not abelian. Why is that? Well, let's just find an example of two elements in G that don't commute with each other. So for example, 2001 times 1101 is 2201. 1101, 2001 is 2101. And these two elements are not equal to each other. So let me say, why did I suppose uh, P is bigger than 2? Because this matrix 2001 is not an element of this group when P equals 2. We've already seen when P equals 2, G is a group of size 2. So it definitely is abelian. OK, so where are we? Like, What's going on is we have G is the product of these two subgroups, HK, that intersect trivially. But G is not isomorphic to the direct product of these two groups. So let's take a step back and ask what the recognition theorem for direct products really says. It says that if H and K are subgroups of G, such that H and K are both normal in G and their intersection is trivial, then the internal direct product, HK, is isomorphic to the direct product, H cross K. But here we're in a situation where G is HK. G is not isomorphic to the direct product. And these two groups do intersect trivially. So 
if both of these groups were normal in G, that would imply that we could apply this theorem and G would have to be isomorphic to H cross K. So this is a very roundabout way of saying that it has to be true that at least one of H and K is not normal in G. So which one is it? So I'm gonna pause in a race and then we'll talk about that. But you can also uh, start to wonder like, we can't apply this recognition theorem for direct products in this way. G just isn't isomorphic to a direct product, but there does seem to be some sense in which this group G is built from these two subgroups, H and K. So that's what we're starting to get at uh, in this lecture. Let's finish up our discussion of this example. So we have this group, we have these two subgroups, H and K. We know that G equals H times K. H and K intersect trivially. So by the recognition theorem, if both H and K were normal in G, G would be isomorphic to the direct product H cross K. But we know that it isn't. So one of those subgroups, H or K at least, has to not be normal in G. So we have a homomorphism, pi, which goes from G to the field F defined by take a matrix AB01 and send it to its upper left entry. It's easy to check that this is a homomorphism. You just need to see uh, what this does to a product of two uh, matrices. So what is the kernel of this homomorphism? Well, it's everything whose upper left entry is one, is the identity of, uh, oh yeah, okay. So this is a homomorphism to the multiplicative group of F, to F star under multiplication. Uh, so the kernel is everything with a one in its upper left entry, but that's exactly H. So H is the kernel of a homomorphism. So H is normal in G. Okay, so that means that there's no way that K is normal in G. If it were, the recognition theorem would say that G was isomorphic to H cross K, and it isn't. So we can also check directly that K is not normal in G by seeing what happens when you conjugate an element of K by some matrix in G. So uh, it's a straightforward computation to see that when you conjugate uh, a matrix by the matrix X, Y, 0, 1, you get A, 0, 1, and then this, BX minus Y times A minus 1. Okay, so what does that mean? If we take a matrix in K, so the uh, upper right entry is 0, so here that would be B equals 0, and you conjugate by some matrix, you put in B equals zero. So what do we get? The upper left entry is the same, but now this uh, upper right entry is minus Y times A minus one, which is not generally zero. So it's just not true. Like when you conjugate a matrix in K by an element of, of G, you usually land outside of K. So that means that K is not a normal subgroup of G because it's not fixed by conjugation the subgroup isn't fixed by conjugation. Okay, so we're gonna come back to this example throughout our discussion of semi-direct products. But since we're here, I just wanna point out there's a nice exercise, uh, which is computing the conjugacy classes inside this group of order P squared minus P. So in the case where F is Z mod PZ, what do the conjugacy classes look like? Well, if you look at this example and see what happens uh, when you start with a certain a and B, and you vary over all possible X and Y, you'll see that the upper left entry never changes as you change this element, X, Y, 0, 1. And that takes you a lot of the way towards understanding the conjugacy classes. So the identity is in its own conjugacy class. Uh, you can see that if you take 1, B, 0, 1, where B is any non-zero element of Z mod P, Z, that's a conjugacy class. Right, so just set A equals one, this is zero, and now you get BX where, uh, so where B is non-zero, uh, X runs through all the elements of uh, Z mod PZ star. That's another conjugacy class. This one has size P minus one. And then you could say, okay, let me pick an upper left entry A that's not one. And uh, for each A in Z mod PZ star, uh, or 
Yeah, for each A in Z mod PZ star, where A is not equal to one, the case that we've already dealt with, uh, we see that we get all the matrices of the form A, B, zero, one, where now B can be anything in Z mod PZ. So the case A equals one, we already dealt with here, which splits into two conjugacy classes. One is the identity, one is everything else. And then the other uh, P minus two elements in Z mod PZ star with A not equal to one, each one gives you a conjugacy class of size P. So altogether, how big is this group? Well, we know the answer, but we have P conjugacy, we have P minus two conjugacy classes of size P each. And then we have one of size one, one of size P minus one. So what we get is P times P minus two plus one plus P minus one, which is P squared minus P and everything has worked out.